Good morning, friends in Christ, on this frigid day. Whose idea was this anyway? Yeah. Mine! I'm grateful for those of you who are bundled up in here this morning, and for those of you who are joining us during our live stream. It's a good day. God has given us this day to worship and enjoy Him. Uh, next week, we go back inside. This is our last outdoor service. And the session has increased the maximum in the sanctuary to 60. If we bump over 60, we'll have overflow viewing in Friendship Hall. And if we bump over 60, we're going to consider quickly adding a second worship service so we can accommodate everybody. I also want uh, to say a word of, of, of comfort to those of you who are Penn State fans this morning. Uh. I know we are a grieving congregation. And I want to say, I hurt with you. You was robbed. That ain't no touchdown. All right, friends, Aaron, lead us in our worship. Let's go. Please stand if you're able. And our hymn to So Sweet to Trust in Jesus is on the back page of your bulletins. And you may be seated. If we are honest with ourselves, we know that there is brokenness and pain and mess inside us. But we have a God who is eager to bring healing and forgiveness, to give us new and abundant life in Christ. So let's go to God and do the prayer of confession in your bulletins. Lord, we have betrayed you by following our own ways. 
We have denied you by fearing to follow yours. We have mocked you by not mourning that our sin put you on the cross. Lord, we are lost. Let your forgiveness find me. Hold us in your strong arms and give us your new life. Live in, in us and with, with us day, day by, by day, day that, that the living water of, of Jesus Christ, Christ may, may flow, flow through us. us. And I invite you into a time of silent confession. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we, we are, are forgiven. forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. everybody. It is good to see you on this brisk morning, but it's a beautiful morning. The trees are all so be such beautiful colors, and it's great to be together and worship the Lord. Well, I have a question for you. Do, how many of you like to make puzzles? Do you like to make puzzles? I do too. And a couple years ago, my husband got me this one. Do you see how many pieces are in there? 2,000 pieces. 2,000. It's like, he must have thought I had nothing to do, right? <laughs> and they're this size. <laughs> they're tiny little things. Well, with a lot of persistence, I did get it done. And I actually had to move to a table in the basement because it was the only place big enough <laughs> for this thing. It was huge. So puzzles can be kind of fun. They can also be a little bit frustrating at times, right? That this sky and the water and all the grasses and the trees, they all look alike on those little bitty pieces. But <laughs> I have a puzzle for you here today. You can see I have six glasses. Three are empty, three have water in them. Okay, so this is a little bit different kind of a puzzle. So here's your challenge. You have to figure out a way to make a pattern. Full, empty, full, empty, full, empty. But the thing is, you think, well, that's easy. You just kind of switch a few of them around. What's the big challenge? The challenge is you can only move one cup. OK, I'll give you a minute. See if you can figure this out. You can only move one cup in order to make this work. Think you've got it? All right, so here's what you do. It's, you take this one and you pour it into this one and then, ta-da, you've only moved one cup. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of fun. But sometimes when you're trying to figure something out like that, your mind starts ugh, getting a brain cramp, right? Because it's hard to figure out some of these things sometimes. And sometimes, 
life can give you a brain cramp. <laughs> it can make you just be frustrated and puzzled and unsure of what in the world is going on, especially in 2020. Everything is different and most things are hard. <laughs> but God's word has some solid encouragement for us in Philippians 4. In this passage, Paul shares how to be content in all situations. Think about what that word contentment means. It's like a little baby cuddled up in your arms, sleeping soundly. It's like how you feel after a nice big dinner and you're sitting around with your family and there's love in the room. Contentment. But I want to give you a little background for this because Paul is writing about contentment while he's sitting in a Roman jail. Not exactly the place where you consider being content. But he shares that being content is possible. Listen to verses 11 to 13. He says, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing and with everything. See the contrast there? I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or an empty one, whether it is with plenty or with little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul writes this while he's in prison. His life has been hard, frustrating, puzzling, and yet he is content. And then we look down to verse 19, and it says, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Wow. Paul is encouraging us that we can always count on God. As Christ's followers, when we suffer with joy and find contentment in all situations, we have the privilege of modeling hope that the world cannot give. Hope that is only found in Jesus. Jesus Emmanuel, we think of that at Christmas time, but Jesus Emmanuel means God with us. And that's not just at Christmas time, that's every day. God is with us, and we can snuggle up to Him and be content even in the hard times of life. Let's pray. Father God, sometimes our life is just very puzzling. We don't understand what's happening. We don't understand why it's happening. We don't understand why people can't get along. We don't understand why health situations are what they are. There's so many things that are hard. And yet, you are with us. And when we keep our focus on you, we can learn, we can learn to be content. Please help us to learn, God. Show us your face. Show us your presence. Show us your love. We trust you. We praise you. And we lift all of this to you in Jesus' precious name. And we all say, Amen. Today we come to the end of what to me has been a wonderful sermon series from the book of Philippians, reading from chapter 4. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly 
that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully sat satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And this is the word of the Lord. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm 
Would you pray with me? Lord God, we're grateful for how you have loved us and claimed us in Christ, for your promises to us, how reliable and faithful you are in your love and your compassion and your care for us. Open your word to us now and thank you for inspiring Paul to write these words. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It took me way too long to realize and it was really only because Susan kept prodding me that I ought to carefully save thank you notes and letters of encouragement that I've received over the years. Two of the churches I served put together binders for me when they had going away parties when we left with letters and pictures and all kinds of wonderful stuff. And I also have saved the letters and notes I've received over the years in a big Ziploc bag that I keep in my credenza near my desk at home. And every once in a while, when I need a little dose of encouragement, I'll pull that out and, and look at some of the notes and, and remember with fondness the person who wrote the note and, and the ministry we shared together. There's nothing like a good thank you note to warm and encourage the heart. Well, Paul's letter to the Philippians is like a, a long thank you note to that congregation. It's the happiest letter that Paul wrote. It's full of thanksgiving and praise and gratitude. And like Sandy said, what's remarkable about that is that Paul wrote this letter while he was sitting in a Roman jail cell. And these weren't like country club prisons that you have today with like pottery classes and French lessons and and recreation centers. Typical Roman jail cells were stone, dirt floors, strewn with straw. There was no bedding, there was no windows, no outside light. Prisoners spent most of their day chained up to the wall. You couldn't complain about the food because the jailers didn't feed you. You were dependent on what people from the outside brought you so you had something to eat. Hygiene. Healthcare, non-existence. Rats would fight you for scraps of food, and you would get sores for where the manacles rubbed your skin raw. Now, if you were chained up in a Roman jail cell like Paul was, what would you write about? Well, we'd probably complain, wouldn't we? Complain about the conditions. Bemoan the injustice of being locked up in the first place gripe about the food, complain about the guards, beg for help getting out of there. But Paul, as we've read, he is overflowing with gratitude. He says, I'm doing fine. He says, whatever happens, I know I'm going to be okay. He praises and compliments the Philippian congregation. He gently corrects a couple of squabbling church members. He writes one of the most profound passages about Jesus in the entire New Testament. Remarkably, in that jail cell, Paul was content. Now, wouldn't you like to have that sort of contentment? One that doesn't depend on your external circumstances. Well, we can through the way that Paul found it and learned it. So for years, an elderly French woman in the little village of Compagnie had a painting hanging on a wall in her little apartment. The woman didn't remember where she got it, where it came from. She thought it was handed down from somebody. But she got curious one day and took it to a local art auction house to see if it was worth anything. When an art expert got a look at the painting, his eyebrows almost flew off his forehead. He sent it off for sophisticated testing that showed that the painting was an early Renaissance masterpiece called Christ Mocked, painted around the year 1280 by the artist Symbaiui. Symbaiui, yes. The painting is worth an estimated $9 million. An unrecognized treasure hanging in an ordinary woman's little apartment. The first part of the secret of contentment is to know that we have hidden treasure in Jesus Christ. That's what makes Paul content, even when he has nothing else. It's enough because he has Christ and Christ has him. 
And the Greek word for content means a, a positive self-sufficiency that outside circumstances can't touch. Because it's in here, it's internal. In the letter he says, it's great that you guys are helping me now that I'm in prison, and I'm grateful, but I'm okay. There were times when you couldn't help me, and I was okay. And there were times when I had everything I needed, and I was okay. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now, if we want this, we get it through making Christ our heart's treasure. The center of your life. What you want more than anything else is to know and to follow Jesus Christ. What you're most grateful for is that Christ loves and accepts and cares for you no matter what. That nothing, nothing, nothing can snatch you out of his hand. And you love him for how he loves the poor and despised and broken. You love him for how he breaks down strongholds of racism and nationalism and the hatreds that divide us. You love him because he's Lord of heaven and earth and he's coming back to bring a new creation. Now this is all really counterintuitive. It reminded me of a Calvin and Hobbes comic. Calvin and Hobbes are sitting under a tree and Calvin asks Hobbes, what do you think is the secret of happiness? Is it money, power, or fame? Before Hobbes can reply, Calvin goes on, I choose money. If you have money, you can buy power and fame. Then you'd have it all and really be happy. Happiness is being famous for your financial ability to indulge in every kind of excess. Hobbes replies, well, I suppose that's one way to define it. And Calvin says, the part I think I'd like best is crushing people who get in my way. <laughs> Paul had nothing. No power, no fame, nothing. He had nothing and he could be locked up in that Roman jail cell and be content. Because he knew that he was chosen, he was loved by the resurrected Lord of all creation. Can you sit with that for a moment? Does it mean anything to you? It should mean everything to us. If you are constantly riding an emotional roller coaster, if you have no peace and contentment in your life, if you're always angry about what people do or don't do for you, you're doing the opposite of what Paul did. Your happiness is being held hostage to what other people say or do to what the mess of life may dish out, held hostage to your own achievement or success. If things go your way, you're happy. If not, you're miserable. That is no way to live. It's not what God wants for you. May I suggest that you need to commit yourself fully to Christ. But to have contentment in everything, you have to trust Christ in everything, and you have to give him everything. It's the difference between tip, dipping your toe in the water, which is what a lot of people in churches are doing, I think, and diving into the deep end of the pool. Someone once came up to Jesus and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, really? Really? I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't know what I'm going to have to eat tomorrow. Still want to follow me? The man's answer is not recorded. Jesus calls us to a day-to-day -day trust and dependence. And through that, we get riches, the Bible promises, in this life and in the next. We're part of God's family. We have the complete security of knowing that we belong to Christ. We know that he's overcome this world. And though the world with devils filled, Christ wins the battle. You give all to get all, including contentment. And that takes us to the second way to find happiness and contentment. And that's through radical generosity. The late Frank Harrington, who was pastor of Peachtree Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, 
told the story of a man who lived in Atlanta, a really successful businessman, very wealthy, got old, and then he died. The man's lawyer was a member of Harrington's church and told him of the story of the reading of the man's will. The families all gathered together in the lawyer's office and they're, they're sad and grieving, but they're also eager to find out what might be coming to them. And the lawyer opens the folder with the rill and reads the first line that went, being of sound mind, I spent it all. <laughs> True story. Paul also did that. He spent it all, he gave it all, he gave all of himself to the mission of following Christ and sharing the gospel. Paul gave himself away in an amazing, life-consuming act of generosity. Now that can seem crazy and over the top, but that is simply the result of having Christ at the center. When you make Christ your heart's treasure, you're willing to share and to give away your treasure, not just willing, you're glad to. It becomes like a reflex, like when the, the dock hits your knee with that little hammer. And when you look for it, this generosity, this theme of generosity, it is all through the Bible, especially in terms of being compassionate to the poor. There are laws that you don't harvest your field right up to the edge. You don't pick all the grapes in your vineyards. You leave that for the poor. Laws that mandated care for the widow, the orphan, the poor. And some of the harshest words of the prophets to the people of Israel are because the people of Israel are failing to do that. You've got all kinds of stuff about generosity, like the people of Israel being crazy generous in providing the stuff to build the tabernacle, the movable worship center that the children of Israel had in the wilderness. Paul gave himself away in following Christ. And in our reading, he thanks the Philippians for their generosity. Like I said, the whole thing's like a sweet-spirited thank you letter for sending him support. And like I told you previously, in jail, you had to have your own food brought in. And what the Philippian church did was to take up a generous collection and send an emissary to bring it to Paul or to whomever was the outside so they can buy him food. They gave out of their joy, it brought Paul joy, not to mention food to eat. Now our culture teaches that happiness comes through getting. The Bible teaches that happiness comes through giving through generosity. And, and this works on all kinds of different levels in human life. I saved an article about the role of generosity in marital happiness. Researchers from the University of Virginia did a national marriage project that studied the role of generosity in the marriages of 2,870 couples. They defined generosity as the virtue of giving good things to one's spouse freely and abundantly. Like simply making them coffee in the morning and bringing it up to your spouse's bedside. And the researchers interviewed men and women about how often they behaved generously with their partners. How often did they express affection with their partners? Well, men and women with the highest scores on the generosity scale were far more likely to report that they were very happy in their marriages. And one of the directors of the study said this, living that spirit of generosity in a marriage fosters a virtuous cycle that leads to both spouses being happier in the marriage. In this thank you to the Philippians, Paul says that he's glad that they gave glad for their sake. He's saying it will be like profit that will be credited to their account. And he's using business language there. And what he means is that God remembers and recognizes the generosity we've shown, the good that we've done. Now this isn't Paul's idea, right? He got it straight from Jesus who said, it's better to build up treasure in heaven than have it on earth. And Paul pushes this to say 
that he's grateful for their gift, not so much that it, because it provided for him, but because God is going to see their gratitude and reward them, that God would continue to provide for them so they could continue to be generous. Do you want to be content? Live with wide open generosity. Share your money and your stuff and yourself, not grudgingly, but with delight because you understand it as a trust given to you to bless others. Because you know you're building up treasure in heaven. I mean, our mission as followers of Christ is to give ourselves away for the sake of others. And the great secret of the gospel is the more you do that, the more you focus on blessing others, the more blessed you become yourself. You know, at the end of our days, the real worth of my life and your life is going to be determined by what we did to help build God's kingdom. Did we help people know Jesus Christ? Did we notice and respond when people were suffering? Did we pray for people who were hurting? Were we a friend to the lonely? Did we stand up for and fight for the poor and oppressed of the earth? All that requires us to be generous with our hearts, our time, our attention, our resources. And the thing is, those little acts of generosity, kindness and love, that we think may go unnoticed, that we may even completely forget about. They are not forgotten by God. And you may do more to change the world that you can, than you can ever see or think or imagine right now. And that's what was happening in the Philippian congregation. There's an amazing verse right at the end of our reading. Go turn to it if you will. It's part of the greetings that Paul has in the end of his letter. Now remember, Paul writes this letter from a prison cell in Rome. He's in jail because he's been stirring up good trouble preaching Jesus Christ. If there were only some kind of electronic device I could use <laughs> to have my text. He's in trouble. He's in jail because he's been stirring up trouble, good trouble in, in preaching about Jesus. Oh, well, Paul was a Roman citizen, and, and during this ordeal, he invoked his right as a Roman citizen to have his case heard by Caesar himself. So he's in Rome waiting for that to happen. And at the very end of the letter, he sends greetings from the Christians in Rome, and he writes this: All the saints greet you. What's the rest of it? Whoa! The emperor at the time was probably Nero, one of the worst and craziest of the Roman empires, who ruled over an empire built by military conquest and on the backs of millions of slaves. Yet the gospel was already reaching into the darkest corners of the empire. Nero's own palace staff, maybe even members of the royal family, they were coming to Christ. Now Nero, tradition tells us, would eventually condemn Paul to death and then become notorious for throwing Christians to the lions in the Colosseum. But the light of Jesus Christ was already pushing back the darkness, even in the heart of darkness, in Nero's own household. And the Philippians, by helping Paul, were part of this. They had no idea of that. And us, with our generosity, giving towards the work of the kingdom of God in the world, we are participating in something way bigger than ourselves, the salvation of the whole world. We may not see the results of what we do in this life, but we will from eternity. And that means I should stop, I think. <laughs> Here's what I want you to do. We're going to have a prayer together. Open up your hands like this. This symbolizes that we are people who receive from the outflowing of the generosity and the love of God. It also symbolizes that we ought to be people with open hands who freely give as God directs us. So let's pray together. 
God, we thank you for your immense generosity shown to us supremely in Jesus Christ and experienced every single day. We confess that sometimes we think of you as stingy and miserly. We complain that we don't have the blessings or success that we think we should have. But we know that you mean us good in all circumstances and all times. And we thank you for how you use us in surprising ways to bring the love and compassion of Jesus Christ to those who are hurting, to those who need salvation and healing. God, help us to make Christ our heart's treasure. Help us to be instinctively, reflexively generous so we can find the deep contentment that Paul had. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We move to a, a time of offering. You can give directly on the little baskets here at the church website at centralonthesquare.org or by text at 717-347-0371 or mail your contributions to the church. Pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for enabling us to be generous. I thank you for the sacrifices made in these offerings and pray that you would direct them to use them in ways that build your kingdom, that share Jesus Christ. And we pray now as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard And through it all
be it for me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea My friends, you have immense riches in Jesus Christ. Let's go from here and share Christ's love, Christ's generosity, Christ's compassion with all whom we meet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.